What's up, guys? Danny Carlson here, and this is the Actualize Freedom Podcast. And today, this is a very interesting episode. This is kind of coming full circle with the man that really was responsible for getting me into Amazon in the first place. I took a Startup Bros course back in 2016, so pretty much taught me most of what I know about Amazon for the first six months anyways. And he is a really interesting case. He is what you consider to be the digital marketing internet internet business wonder boy who just figured this stuff out when he was like, I think as young as 12 years old and has continued to build a profitable online business all the way up until the still ripe old young age of what? You're 27 now, Will? 28. I'll be uh, turning 29 soon. So almost 30. Almost 30. Well, still a very impressive resume for almost 30 years old. So it's my pleasure to introduce Will Mitchell from Startup Bros. Very, very successful digital marketing prodigy. Welcome to the podcast, Will. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good intro. And uh, yeah, I know Danny and I have been talking for a long time and have both seen each other kind of develop and change over the years. So yeah, it's exciting to kind of see our relationship come full circle too. Yeah, well, for one, your hair has grown quite a bit since, uh, since last time. And my hair has actually been cut. Mine used to be down to my belly button and now it's shorter. So we traded places there. So Will, let's start out by going into... What are you currently working on? Like, tell us a little bit about Startup Bros and the different projects that you have going on. Yeah, so Startup Bros is basically my, my passion project. Uh, I do run an e-commerce company and, and that company does very well, uh, but it's a very big company now and I pretty much annoy everyone when I go into the office. So it's more just strategy and talking with the other executives and things like that now. So a lot of my actual kind of work time uh, goes into Startup Bros because Startup Bros is way more fun to me. Uh, and Startup Bros is all about kind of this core belief that I've had since a very young age that I think school and the current education system and a lot of how people are raised is actually making them worse at entrepreneurship. So a lot of people that want to be entrepreneurs, they've gotten a lot of these bad habits in, in school and things like that. And, um, and that was one of the main things that drove me to start Startup Bros. Over time, you know, anytime I have free time, pretty much, uh, I'm putting it into Startup Bros. And it's really turned into a good symbiotic relationship because we in Startup Bros figure out all these new marketing methods and all these new ways to rank products on Amazon and all these things. And then, um, and then we transfer all that knowledge over to the e-commerce company and back and forth it goes. So uh, it's been really fun to grow both of the companies together. And uh, yeah, really lucky because it's generally bad advice to have multiple businesses, but uh, luckily Startup Bros has allowed me to do that. Yeah, unless you figured out digital marketing when you're 12 years old, in which case you probably can do multiple businesses. Uh, but that is something that you helped me realize, Will, is the whole, the school system does not prepare you for entrepreneurship and you have a really great way of looking at it. Um, can you explain what you mean by entrepreneurship is a degree you have to pay for by losing money? I love that whole principle. Yeah, you know, every I can really think back to so many different situations in my entrepreneurial career. And when I make big breakthroughs, it's usually attached to some big failure. It's, it's act, attached to some big risk I took that didn't work out, some big assumption I have had that, you know, turned out the other way. So, I, I think entrepreneurship at the end of the day is something that you have to learn through pain. In general, you learn quickly through pain, right? We all know not to go touch the stove because it was hot the first time we touched it and we're not going to do it again. So we don't even really have to think about this stuff. It's just built into us. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so entrepreneurship, I think, is not something you can learn in school. There's no teacher that's going to sit you down and say, you know, here's why you shouldn't spend $900 on Facebook ads or something, right? I constantly do business coaching with people that say, hey, should I do this? Should I do that? And it's like, listen, business is not this black and white thing like school is. Success in school is very black and white and you either make it or you don't. And it's all based on this one authority person that tells you if you're right or wrong. Entrepreneurship is the wild west. Like no one knows who's right. No one knows who's wrong. An 18 year old can go dethrone Google next week like it is pure chaos in here and that's the fun of it. Uh, so you can't learn this stuff in school. You can get into it in school and you can talk about it in school, but ultimately like you knowing what good decisions are versus bad decisions, your gut instinct as an entrepreneur is attached to how quickly can you fail, right? Fail fast and fail well because that's ultimately the main competitive advantage you have other, uh, 
uh, over other entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and I, I love the way of looking at it as like, is basically a degree that you're, you're paying for by making these mistakes and losing money. So let's say that there's a young person, they, they have, let's say, $40,000 and they can either go to school or they can go start a business or something like that and you know, earn their entrepreneurship degree by losing money, so to speak. What kind, of, what kind of advice would you give them to make that decision, like whether entrepreneurship is good for them? I think you have to realize that once you make this decision to become an entrepreneur and not go to college, you are making one of the riskiest decisions you can ever make in your life. Now, if, if that's exciting to you, then you're probably an entrepreneur and you should probably just jump into that career as quick as you can. Uh, if that terrifies you, then you're probably not ready to make that leap yet. And that's fine. Like go to college and college is one of the best places to make money on the side I've ever seen in my life because no one actually spends any of their own money. It's all, it's all student loan money and it's all their parents' money. So, I mean, you can go set up a little booth in college and make a ton of money that way. Like you don't have to judge yourself based on you know, your ability to quit your job or quit college or all these things like that. It's, it's ultimately a risky and stupid thing to do, but I wanted to do it. And it kind of fueled me just like Julius Caesar, you know, kind of burned the, uh, well, this is a myth they say, but when Julius Caesar, you know, with the Roman army invaded Britain, uh, none of his soldiers wanted to do it. And they basically landed and like weren't motivated at all. And they weren't going to do it. So Caesar said, all right, I'm going to go burn every boat we have. And he burnt all of his boats. And he said, listen, we're either going to conquer Britain and build new boats or that's it. We're not going home. So all of a sudden they were really motivated and uh, got lots of work done. So, I mean, that's essentially what I did to myself at a very young age. And I said, I'm going to drop out, blow up my resume. I'm going to be completely unemployable. And it's the stupidest thing I could do. But because of that, I'm going to be ultra successful. That's what's going to fuel me to success. So, um, so yeah, to, to go back to your original question though. So if someone is, is on the precipice, you know, they're graduating, they're trying to figure out, am I going to go to college or am I going to go on my own? They got $40,000 in the bank. There's no right or wrong decision, but you do have to realize that they're both probably going to cost the same. Um, school is going to cost a lot of money over a long period of time and the long-term opportunity cost could be greater than you could ever imagine. Uh, this side, the entrepreneurship side, you're going to lose that $40,000. Like, it's going. <laughs> so, <laughs> say goodbye to that, and you're probably going to lose a whole bunch more money on top of that. But through that, you're going to start to learn how to actually make money and how to actually manage wealth and how to build wealth over time. And ultimately, that's what people want, right? No one wants to just make money on the side to see more money in their bank account. They want to feel wealthy. They want to feel powerful. They want to feel free. They want to feel in control. Well, that stuff doesn't come through just having a lot of money in the bank. In fact, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with having a lot of money in the bank. Where, where real power and wealth and, and freedom comes from is you going through and losing money a bunch of times so you know how to make money better than anyone else. Like, that's the truth of it. Well, and speaking of that, Will, you have started so many different projects throughout your entrepreneurial journey, and a lot of them did not end up working out. What are some notable examples of projects that, that really just flopped, and why did, they, why did they fail in retrospect? So I, I, could, I would need a good week to come up with a, a full list. But yeah, I've, I've tried tons of things, because I started when I was 12 years old, and like, you know, I, I, it's not like I was dressed up in a suit at 12 years old, but like I was hustling online trying to figure this stuff out at 12 years old. Let me tell you what, no one wants to buy things from 12 year olds. I don't know what, <laughs> apparently we're completely untrustworthy or something. So, uh, so yeah, I've tried it all. I, I did everything that you've ever seen on warrior form, on black hat form, on, you know, just every website you can imagine. I've been trying it all for so long. And ultimately that's why I, I understand when, you know, people ask me questions in, in a business coaching setting is why I ultimately know kind of where they're coming from and where they're trying to end up is because I, I just, it's not like I was just a natural at this. I just got started a lot earlier than most people. Most people get started at 22 when they get out of college. I said, I'm going to drop out of high school and just start now. So I just have another 10 years on everyone. Uh, you know, 
not like I'm special or anything though. You just got to hustle and grind and um, yeah. Okay. So did people in the warrior forums know that they're, they're talking to a 12 year old when you're like, you're giving them business advice and there's some username there and they assume that it's some very experienced adult businessman. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure back then I was like super cocky too. I was probably like, listen guys, I know what marketing is and let me tell you how this works. Uh, <laughs> But I, I've tried everything from painting, you know, painting uh, uh, curbs with spray paint and stencils to, you know, selling water to t-shirt businesses. I've had three t-shirt businesses. Uh, I had a jean company. What was I thinking with that one? I had a auction website called fashionbidder.com where I thought I was going to go up against eBay, but just for fashion. Uh, like just all this crazy stuff. It, you know... I, I could literally go on and on. I had this business called Bumper Crop that was all about like, you know, if I had an apple tree in my backyard that had a bunch of extra apples, I could trade it with my neighbors for their extra oranges. And like, I, I've, I've done it all, man. And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the, a couple of interesting things I found in that process. First of all, there's really a ton of ways to make money. In business, if you stick to it, if you really have a goal and you stick to it, you will figure out how to make a living in whatever you want to do. I promise you. I've seen people make livings in some of the wildest, most bizarre ways possible. I've seen people make livings, hard livings, easy livings. So you can make it if you just stick to it, whatever your goal is. Um, and the other thing too is that it, it's all just like putting in the time and putting in the struggle. Most people want to think that this whole journey is going to be all sunshine and rainbows and you know, the social network movie where it's just all just like adrenaline rush. And the truth is like the majority of this is sitting alone in your office with no one else with you and just struggling. And the more you can struggle and the more you can learn to love that struggle, it doesn't matter if you're trying to become a professional basketball player or the best entrepreneur you can be. If you learn to love the struggle and love the pain and challenging yourself, you are going to be wildly successful in whatever you do. Absolutely love that. Just framing, framing all the little failures, all the struggles as I'm going in the right direction instead of I am stupid or I can't figure this out or anything like that. It's just like the mental reframing of the struggle and the failures, right? Yes, absolutely. There's a great book called um, Success. And uh, I thought I might have it next to me, but uh, there's a great book called Success. I don't recommend people really read it because after you read like the first 20 pages, you just get everything and it just repeats itself. But um, it's one of the only mindset books that's completely grounded in biology and science. So everything is based off of actual neuroscience and actual studies. And what's interesting is they boil down like 120 years of mindset research into one kind of simple little concept. And it's you're either in a fixed mindset where you think that you have fixed abilities or you're in a growth mindset where you think you can change your abilities. And that's basically it. And um, it's really interesting because like, you know, I do a lot of business coaching. So just last week we had someone, you know, we, we were all doing personality testing in one of my business coaching things. So the Myers-Briggs personality test, you know, everyone was posting the results, posting the results. And then one person posted and said, guys, I can't tell you how much my life has changed reading these comments. I had no idea that you could change your personality. And this person like was nearly in tears with this revelation that they could, where it had the power to change personality traits that they had. This was something completely outside of them before this. So just having that realization is going to enable this person to change who they fundamentally are as a person. Um, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. If I'm in a growth mindset, I'm excited for challenges. I like failing because that means I'm growing in a growth mindset. Like the only thing that's fun is failing in a growth mindset. In a fixed mindset, everything is about proving to other people what your abilities are. And what happens in the fixed mindset is, you know, if, if I'm like good at baseball, come, you know, growing up, well, I'm going to lean on that and I have my little fixed mindset that like I'm better at baseball. No one can beat me. I'm just naturally talented. And then by the time I'm getting into high school and everyone's like hitting the gym and the weight room, well, you know what? I'm not going to hit the weight room because like, why would I need to? I'm naturally good at baseball. And every time I hit the weight room, it kind of makes me feel like I'm falling behind. So these people in the fixed mindset end up just depressed and 
powerless in their own lives. And it's really just all in their own head. It's amazing. So fixed mindset versus growth mindset. You have to realize that you can drastically change your personality, how assertive you are, how deep your voice is, like how you look, how people perceive you when they talk to you, uh, all your intelligence, all of these things can be greatly changed very quickly by you, uh, but only if you realize that you have the power to. I absolutely love that whole fixed mindset versus gross mindset, mindset thing. Um, Tom Bilyeu from Impact Theory Podcast talks a lot about that and a very good resource to look at on that as well. Uh, something that like I'm definitely not perfect at, but the more that I do stay within the growth mindset, super, super beneficial. And Will, tell so, us. Yeah. Sorry, sorry just one thing ahead. on that. It's yeah. interesting because uh, it's not like you just have one or the other mindset, right? We all have both mindsets in different areas of our lives. And um, it's really interesting because some of the biggest breakthroughs I've made personally in the past couple of years, like I used to tell myself that I just don't like managing people. I just don't like it. It's just not, I'm just not good at it. This is just something I kept on repeating to myself. and it's, I, I can't get good at managing people. And then finally, at the beginning of 2018, I, I was like, listen, this is, this is just something I keep on telling myself. Like if I really want to get to the next level where I want to be, then I better figure out how to like managing people and I better stop telling myself I'm not good at it because uh, that's not going to take me where I need to be. So everyone has this and it's not something that you can escape. The bigger you get, the harder it is to keep on drowning out any uh, fear, really, right? You can either, a lot of entrepreneurs, they make like a million bucks and then they get out of growth mode they stop doing everything that made them successful and their only concern is preserving and keeping the million dollars. Well, those, that's, those are the people that end up losing the million. You got to keep risk on and you got to keep on doing the things that you know, made you successful in the first place. Yeah, and there's such a good example of that that a lot of people listening can probably relate to that I used to have is I used to tell myself that I wasn't good at remembering people's names and consequently, I was not very good at remembering people's names because I would literally tell people after I forgot their name, oh, I'm terrible at remembering names. And I just reinforced that all the freaking time. But um, the more I started looking into this kind of stuff and actually practicing, not telling myself that, but telling myself the opposite, magic. I can actually remember people's names uh, the first time I actually talk to them now because I'm not reinforcing that negative belief about myself. So funny. Yeah. I mean, people are capable of so much more. I mean, we're all like lazy Westerners, wait, lazy Americans just sitting around building businesses on computers. Like you go watch a movie and see what the actual human spirit is capable of. Like, of course we have the ability to change how assertive we are on a phone call or change if we like making phone calls. Like, come on, you think, you think we can't change that? Human beings are way more impressive than, uh, than that. Yeah, we, we've had some pretty incredible achievements. It's pretty not a big stretch to think that we can do that. Um, so, Will, you have a ton of digital marketing background and in e-commerce specifically. Can you talk to us a little bit about building an incredible product versus being the best marketer and having the best marketing tactics? Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is, yeah, some, so a concept I've come up with over the years to kind of think about this. Um, you have all of these these horizontal activities that you're doing in your business, right? And, you know, these are things that you're going to do over time. These are your different business activities. So one of your horizontal activities might be social media marketing. Another one might be email marketing. Uh, another one's obviously like customer service. And so you have all these kind of ver uh, horizontal activities that you're doing over time. But you do also in your business have these vertical items which intersect every single thing that you do. And what I would consider some of your vertical items to be would be your brand, your logo, your business name, the kind of look and feel of, you know, your product, uh, the actual purchasing and usage experience, the customer experience of your product. These are things that no amount of marketing is going to make those things better, right? If people just don't like your product, you can't out market that. There's no marketing. Like marketing is, is throwing a match on a fire, right? That's what marketing is. All of the vertical activities, these are basically your tinder, all your, all your fuel on the fire. But if you don't put like match fuel on the fire, the match is just going to sit there and burn out, right? No amount of marketing, no matter how big the match, right, is going to change that if you don't have the right fuel in the fire. 
So your vertical activities intersect all your horizontal activities and they have a huge effect on every single thing that you do. So, you know, if I'm selling an iPhone versus some crappy phone that I just threw together and everyone knows is terrible, like every single dollar I spend on marketing is going to be more profitable with the iPhone, obviously. This is all obvious to, to all, all uh, aspiring entrepreneurs when we say it out loud, but for some reason we forget about it when we actually build our businesses. So the great thing about especially Amazon is they are essentially giving you all their customers and saying, you know what, you don't worry about customer acquisition. We're going to give you our customers and you just focus on building the best product at the best price and presenting it in the best way possible. And that's basically your job on Amazon is just to perfect the product and perfect the offering. Once that's perfect, every ad campaign you do is going to be hugely successful. Influencer marketing, YouTube ads. Like if you have something that people love, just putting it in front of their faces and making them aware of it is going to make them want to buy it. But if you don't have something people love, you're going to put it in front of their faces and they're going to be like, who's this dick? <laughs> like, I don't want this in front of my face. Get this out of here. And ho hopefully that's a good word for the podcast. But, uh, uh, oh, totally so yeah, fine. I, I, yeah. So no dicks in people's face is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, and I, I think, I think that's the real core of it is if you have a good product, like too many people are focused on, so here's one of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever made in my career was when I stopped thinking about SEO as this technical thing that I had to master some algorithm. And I just stopped and said, you know what? I'm just, if Google's goal here is to create, is to send traffic to the most relevant and best content, why don't I just leapfrog everyone that's looking at the algorithm? Why don't I just create the, the actual best content for this keyword? And you know what happened after I did that is every year I get more and more and more traffic because as Google perfects their algorithm, it just plays into me more and more and more. So I don't know why people are so obsessed with the algorithm, honestly. Like we know what the algorithm is there to do. It is there to increase revenue per click, increase the amount of money that Amazon gets. We know the major metrics that Amazon looks at to rank products. So again, like having a great product is going to unlock everything for you and everything's gonna work out. If you don't have a good product though, like no amount of marketing is ever gonna save you. Yeah, and I totally love that. I have a lot of friends on both sides of the fence, to be honest. I have some friends who they focus on the product and they, most of the time, those are the people that I know that are very, very successful. But I also know a lot of people who, uh, for example, they were in the SEO world and they were doing all the black hat SEO tricks and whatever, and they made a whole bunch of money, but then all of a sudden, Google's algorithm changes and they get penalized and their entire business is down the toilet because they were just relying on marketing tactics to get their stuff. And on Amazon, it's the same way, right? People build a business around some kind of black hat or weird loopholes. And then once that loophole closes, then all their traffic goes down the toilet, they get penalized or account suspended or whatever it is. And they're at the mercy of however the algorithm changes. And that's not a real sustainable business, is it? Yeah, it's definitely not. It's definitely not a business. And, um, you know, again, I had the luxury of starting very early. So I had a few situations like this where I would make a ton of money on some little thing, some little hustle, and then it would end. And it was crazy. I, I would literally feel worse than before I even did it. But again, for me, it's never been about the money. Like I just have fun with business. So the fact that I felt worse after making thousands of dollars and it closed, loophole closed, like I, I just realized really quickly that these aren't real businesses. I can't get a job. <laughs> like I was unemployable. I didn't even have a high school diploma. I had no job experience or anything. So for me, it was like, my God, if, if I don't figure out by the time I'm 18 years old, how to make at least $30,000 for myself, I don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, so yeah, I really quickly realized that, you know, it's, it's really tempting to go into the get rich quick stuff. And I think almost everyone's going to dabble in it a little bit, but the, the quicker you can pull out of it and really try to build, like you should be trying to build $10 million companies, $50 million companies. That's, you know, a good place to try to build to. I think if you're just trying to hustle and make money on the side, 
it's going to take you a long time to realize why that's a bad decision, but it is a bad decision. It's going to put you in very bad situation financially, uh, from a career and reputation perspective. Uh, your mind is just like, you're not going to be confident. Your mind's going to be all over the place. It, it's a lot of people in this industry put themselves in a very bad mindset just because they're, you know, buying a different course every single day and doing a different business model every day, which like I said, you can make money with pretty much, if you see someone selling a course about a business, you can probably go make a full-time living with that business model. But the thing is you have to like stick to it and build the freaking business because it's going to be hard. So whichever business you stick with and build though, um, there's thousands of different ways to, to make that much money. So, Will, was there a particular point in time that really stands out where you made that mindset shift between looking for the quick buck, looking for these fancy, these fancy internet marketing tactics to, hey, maybe it makes more sense to really just focus and build this business. Was there some kind of, some kind of insight maybe that you got or at some point in your life that you started to make that shift? Um, you know, I had the luxury of kind of coming from the startup world. Uh, so I kind of had a foot in both the, the internet marketing and the startup and entrepreneurship world. And it's always been really wild to me that these two worlds are essentially completely disconnected. Like even some of the biggest marketers in the world who everyone knows their name, I've talked to these guys about like, like startups and Silicon Valley and just like the business world in general, they are clueless. Like it is a completely disconnected world. And it's always been really strange to me. So when did this mindset shift happen for me? Um, when, when I was very young, because I realized, you know, selling counterfeits wasn't going to, like, I wanted to be wealthy. I literally, like right next to me, I, I have my goals written down from when I was 16 years old. The night I turned 16 years old, I wrote down all my goals for my life. And, um, and like, I just wanted to do bigger things than make three grand a month selling counterfeits online. Like I, I just wanted to build something great, something, some real wealth, uh, some real financial freedom. And you're just not going to do that with any type of get rich quick scheme. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, and it, it, it would honestly, and Danny, you probably agree. It would probably be like a whole nother two hour webinar to really get in the details of what is the difference between a get rich quick scheme and a real business model. And why is that, is that difference so great over time? But, um, but I, I do hope that, you know, people realize that you're going to want to go into the get rich quick stuff, but it, it's not, it's just not sustainable. It's just not long-term. You might learn a couple good tactics, but what you're going to realize in the long run is that you as a business owner should be hiring people that know the tactics and are really into the tactics. And your job is really just like getting people in the right seat and figuring out how the business can make money off of those activities that these people are doing. Um, so, when, when did that mindset shift really happen though? Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you almost exactly when it happened was uh, with the counterfeits, I got shut down like everywhere, completely banned. And then after that, I had an airsoft business that did really well for a while. Um, that ended up getting shut down as well. Uh, and that was like a legitimate business, but got shut down for a different legal reason. Uh, the Chinese shut me down. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, the spot that really got me though, there was like this iPhone thing on like some affiliate site. And it was like, hey, you know, get people to fill out this form to send in their iPhone and we'll give you eight bucks or something. So I just like straight, you know, black hat marketer scammed it. Uh, I, you know, set up the form on my website and then I got micro workers and I, I paid like 10 cents a micro worker to get people to sign up for this thing. So over the course of like two months, I, I think I made like eight, nine grand off of this thing. And I was like 14, 15 at the time. And uh, it was great. Like I was just absolutely killing it. And then of course I got caught because it was purely fraudulent and they shut me down. And, uh, and at that point, for some reason, something snapped in me. And that, that was like the fourth or fifth time I had figured out how to make money, but failed again because it was just illegitimate. And at that point I said, you know what? I, I know how to make money. Like, I know how to do it. I'm confident that I know how to make money in the real world. There's no reason for me to keep on going with illegitimate products. Why don't I just be a legit entrepreneur, a legit business person? And 
again, lucky for me, it only took me, you know, three years to figure that out because I, I think a lot of people just do that. Yeah, well, you had figured that out at an age that all I wanted to do, like if I wrote out my life goals at 16 years old, it'd probably be, I want to just be a drummer in a metal band and get drunk every weekend. Uh, I'd be like my life goals right there. Ha have a hot girlfriend, you know? <laughs> but here you are writing out like goal. dollar business. That was probably my goal at like 11 or 12, to be fair. And it's interesting, like, you know, personality types. I think I was always kind of destined to get into marketing and entrepreneurship because when I had a band, uh, we would get together and we would play this music and all this. And I was always into like the logos and setting up the pure volume website and like, you know, all that. And then I had this, this revelation one day I was walking out of the band thing and I was like, man, we really suck. And, um, and I was like, but wait a second, there's a lot of people that suck out there and they all, they all do pretty well. So what's the secret? And then I realized, you know what? Music is really about effective marketing. Just like anything, just like any product, if I can get the right music in front, of, in front of the right person at the right time, I will have an incredible following for my band and I will make it. No matter how many, like how big it is or how stupid the music is, like if I can find those fans and there's fans out there for every type of music, then I can have a successful band. But, but I realized that it's really just marketing. And that was another thing that led me out of that world and into business was the realization that even being in a band is really just marketing. Yeah, I actually met recently here in the Philippines a guy who is crushing it with um, a digital marketing agency for bands. And a lot of the artists that he's working with, honestly, you've shown me some of them, they're not that good, but he's an incredible digital marketer. He's got an incredible team behind him and he knows what he's doing. So these people are popular artists because he's incentivized. He gets a percentage of whatever they make, so they are now popular bands. So if you guys want to be a rock star, um, let me know, and I'll hook you up with this guy. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that crazy, though? Like, literally, think about how many artists out there are working so hard and creating such good music, but will never be noticed and will, like, die on their deathbed cynical and upset because they couldn't figure out simple marketing. Um, it's just tragic. It really is. So many of the great products in this world are never noticed because no effective marketer to push it yeah and there's one one example in my life before i got into business i was really into downhill skateboarding and you know i had sponsors and budgets for traveling around and and uh you know didn't make a full-time living off of it but almost no one was at the time but there were a lot of people who were way better longboarders than me these these guys could they could do way harder stuff than me they're faster than me but they didn't they didn't get the same deals but I figured out how to position myself, how to market myself to these companies so I was an attractive sponsee to them. So, you know, un unfortunately, these kids that are much, they're much better than I was, just it's not all about merit. A lot of it's to do with branding and marketing, right? Just even, even when it comes to professional sports. Yep. And it's unfortunate to an extent, but um, it's the world. So you got to play into it as a business person and just make sure you understand how to Marketing is very simple. Uh, and it sounds like Danny, it sounds like you're a natural marketer as well. Uh, if you're going into, you know, if you're doing downhill skateboarding and thinking about how to position yourself correctly to sponsees on the way down, you're, you're clearly a natural marketer yourself too. Um, and yeah, you know, the other thing too, just to go a little off track is people should really be more cognizant of those things in their life. Um, like, you know, Danny had this natural marketing itch. He kept on going back to marketing. I was in a band and I was thinking about marketing. Um, like, look for those little things, those little thoughts that you have that other people would be like, that's really freaking weird. Because uh, you might find some really unique skills and some of your true passions uh, through doing that. I love that advice. And also, you have a really interesting principle that you call the 99-1 principle. Can you explain that for us? Yeah, so... Um, th so this, this was how, one of the ways I stopped my procrastination was the, uh, coming up with the 99-1 rule. And so everyone's heard about the 80-20 rule and the 80-20 rule is, you know, 20% of your results is going to come from, or I'm sorry, 80% of your results is going to come from 20% of your inputs. So, you know, 80% of the Chicago Bulls results came from Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman, right? 20-80. Uh, and, and this exists everywhere. Uh, just everywhere, you know, 80%, uh, 
or you know, 80% of the height is owned by 20% of the humans and it's just in everything. 80% of the wealth is owned by 20% of the people and just on and on and on. So the 80-20 rule is a really interesting rule and it's really valuable for people to prioritize better and just be more productive. But my main problem in life was getting things to like 85, 90% done and just like feeling inside like I did something and then just leaving the project and then it wouldn't get completed ever. So I had this, I had this issue over and over again. And I said, finally, like after a hundred projects like this, where I had just a huge pile of projects that were all like 90% done, I said, wait a second, you know what? I'm actually not getting anything done. I think I'm getting things done. I feel like I'm getting things done, but I'm actually getting nothing done because the way the world works is on the 99-1 principle. And the 99-1 principle says, hey, if I go through and I'm going to write a, a blog post or, hey, so me and Danny are doing this web or this, uh, this interview right now, right? So imagine if Danny went through, he did this interview with me. He did all the scheduling beforehand, all the prep work. He did all the editing, everything. He just got it like 98% of the way there but then he stopped. How much value did he get out of that project? Out of the potential value of the project, how much did he get out of it? Well, the real goal of the project was like to let you guys see it, right? So if this never got published, it'd be pretty useless. Like, yeah, me and Danny would have been closer friends and maybe we learn a thing or two and that's like a little valuable. But the big value of this project is just in hitting the freaking publish button. So imagine it, this is what a lot of people do. They take projects and they, they'll spend 20 hours, 30 hours perfecting this project and they'll take it 98%, 99%, right to the point where they have to hit the publish button or the go button and then they just don't. They like get scared and it just sits there. Well guys, 99.1, like 99% of the value of you, that project, of any project, is gonna come at the 1% where you're finishing the project, right? If I go to write a blog post, I'd better make sure that I'm hitting publish because almost all of the value of me writing a blog post, the entire reason I did it is so I could hit publish and send it out to you guys, right? So again, the 99-1 rule is just don't think about 80-20 uh, or think about it, but also think about the 99-1 because you don't want to be starting projects and getting things to 97%, 95%. What that's going to do is just create a huge to-do list for you and you're not going to be able to think straight. You're going to have too much going on. So, um, so that's the 99-1 rule and it's a great way to stop procrastination. Yeah, I mean, I really love that one because that's something I struggle with quite a bit. <laughs> I'm very guilty of starting so many cool new, oh, here's a new marketing strategy. Oh, I had an inspiration for this blog post and I wrote most of it and then I never finished it. And then, oh, these videos have been a draft on YouTube for a month now, <laughs> but it still hasn't been scheduled in. Uh, usually because of one little thing. It's like, oh, I did the thumbnail image. I haven't got a graphic designer to get the thumbnail image yet. And it sits there for a month. You know what I mean? So this yeah. to me, hearing you say that was a really good, a really good wake up call to see where I'm doing that in my business. Cause I do that with a lot of different things. <laughs> that helped me a lot. And the thing is every entrepreneur, almost every entrepreneur I've ever met is a starter. You can either be a starter or a finisher. You're either going to derive value from starting new things or finishing existing things, right? So we got to hire finishers because we're going to be starters. But yeah, we do have to get better at, you know, finishing things when we start them too. Huge problem for me as well. I think every entrepreneur. The other thing that really helped me with that, because it took multiple principles. Uh, I probably have about 15 principles to stop procrastination, but I'm finally getting there. Um, the other... The other principle that helped me a lot with that um, was do things that customers see. For a long time, I got in this pattern of doing things that customers would never see. And it's like, yeah, some of that's valuable. Like, I, you know, I got to do the bookkeeping of the business. We got to file taxes. But when you're going through and working and getting deep into projects and tasks, just make sure that the customer is actually going to see this work. Because what's the real point of it? if the customer doesn't see it. Another, one last fun way I'll give you to think about this that has helped me. Um, if all of the customers of your company collectively were the CEO and they were in control of all the money that they were putting into this company via product purchases, where would they want you spending your time and money, right? Would, would they look at some of the things, the open projects and be like, this is crazy, why are we doing this? 
would, would they look at what you were working on yesterday and be like, listen, I just don't want you working on this. Like I want, like, this is my company and I want this. Imagine the customers collectively were the CEO and running the company. And it's, it's always just helped me. I don't know. It helps me kind of dissociate and kind of manage myself. That's such a good way of looking at things. Instead of you looking at your customers as just potential dollars in your pocket, you're now thinking, you're now aligning your thinking with your customers, which I think any business could benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Especially, it's so easy to procrastinate through being busy. There's a little poster I have up in, in my main office area for where my staff works. It says, uh, are you being productive or just being busy? Because it's so easy and the more successful you get, the more busy work there is and the easier it is to just be busy and not productive. So, you know, what does productive mean? It means produce, producing. So uh, always make sure you're producing things that customers will actually see and care about because that's ultimately going to grow the company. Yeah, I mean, personally, I have to hold myself to my productivity systems tooth and nail to get over these kind of problems of just staying busy all the time. But Will, man, this has been super, super valuable what we've gone over here. Um, really interesting insights. I wanted to keep this less about Amazon and more about this kind of stuff because that is obviously you've proven now you have such a good insight into this kind of stuff over such a long career starting out at 12 years old up until almost 30 years old now. Um, I'm sure we could go on for another couple hours about this, but where can people find you online if they want to reach out to you or learn more about what you do? I think we could keep on going on for another hour. This is fun. Um, my website is startupbros.com. My email is will at startupbros.com. Uh, I have a course right now that I'm doing called Productivepreneur. Uh, there's no like official website for it yet. We're in kind of the beta version. Um, but feel free to email me, will at startupbros.com. And if you want to join our uh, productivity community or, or see some of our productivity stuff, uh, this is all pretty related to that, what we talked about today. And yeah, it's always fun. Uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about Amazon and obviously the, the main Startup Rose course that we have is about starting Amazon businesses. But um, it is just so much fun to talk about this stuff because I, I've been doing the Amazon coaching since 2014 now and repeatedly over time, I see the same patterns. Like there's people in my Amazon program and Danny, you know a lot of them. There's people who will tell you, I am a multimillionaire today because of that program. So we know that the program works for, for a certain segment of people. How is there still, you know, 10 to 20% of people who are refunding from it, right? So this, this really haunted me for a long time. And obviously, if we're all going through the same material and having drastically different results, it's got to be something in how we're processing the information and doing it, right? So since 2014, I mean, the kind of stuff we've been talking about today, it sounds fluffy and it sounds not as valuable as a lot of the tactics out there. But I'll tell you what, this is what actually holds people back. This is what, uh, if you can figure this stuff out, not only are you going to be super successful in whatever you try to do, but you're also just going to have a ton of fun doing it, which is for me, what business is all about having a great time doing it. So yeah, thanks Danny for having me. Cause this was a great time and hopefully everyone else enjoyed it as well. I definitely enjoyed the time. Will and guys, be sure to check him out. I've known, uh, I've been following Will for a long time and he's one of the clearer voices in the Amazon space. He's not trying to teach you all these, these dumb tactics that are going to be useless in two months. He wants to teach very core business principles for building long-term brands. So definitely one of the better voices to look out to. Uh, we'll have links to everything you talked about in the show notes at KenGROI.com slash blog. So be sure to check that out. And until next time, thanks for joining us, Will. Yeah, thanks, Danny.